Today is a very exciting day because after three years, the ZX Spectrum Next is finally here in this box. Oh, it's like being in 1983 or four or five all over again. Let's crack this little beauty out. Oh, look at that. Look at it. Look at that. It looks like a Spectrum box should look. It's got gloss, it's got matte, it's got colours, it's got... It's not too overstated. We've got the Spectrum just swished across the box like that. Like on previous boxes. What a thing. On the back we've got uh, all sorts of things. The ZX Spectrum Next is the evolution of the original Sinclair 8-bit computer that kick-started a generation of bedroom coders whose games shaped the way we play to this day. Built from scratch with dedicated hardware, the ZX Spectrum Next boasts added features that makes playing the original games a breeze and opens the door for brand new titles taking advantage of its improvements such as better audio, more colours, larger memory and faster processor. Cool, yeah, we're talking 3.5 megahertz Z80. That's the same as normal. What? 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 It's got additional turbo modes. Uh, this is the unaccelerated version, hence why I have it slightly before the accelerated versions. These ones shipped first. Exclusive games, we've got Dreamworld Pogi, Dungeonette, Lords of Midnight Monkey McGee, No Mercy, Quakestar, Warhawk, Wonderful Dizzy. Look. Well, this is incredible. Look at, look, look at that. It's just, oh, oh I can't take the excitement. Right, I mean, there's a few marks on this box. You know, if the, the ship, the handlers were a bit excited about it as well. Oh, we've got some damage and, oh, oh so, a nice foam bit of padding on the top inner of a box there to try and keep it secure but the packaging has given way inside which is a shame you know this must have I don't know if it was Yodel who delivered it but it's it's obviously been buffeted about and it's torn the box at the edge which is a shame look oh oh look oh, the keys they oh, it feels like a spectrum should but not crap, it feels improved. Because it's the same sort of mechanism, but so much nicer. A bit of a mark on that key. A couple of marks here and there. Let's ease it out of its packaging. See what we have. It feels like a solid little unit. It feels sturdy. It feel, I mean, it feels like a Spectrum 128K. There's a few scratches. I've seen a, a few other people have reported scratches on the back here and there. This one seems to have the same scratches as a few other people have reported, which, you know, they're not heavy scratches, but just a, just a bit on the back. I like this. <laughs> okay, now we also get a box here, which contains all sorts of power adapters, depending on which country you're in, and the uh, power supply itself, which is reassuring and the manual. Now, there's a big thing about the manual cover being a surprise, so if you don't want that ruined, then look away now. We have this lovely manual, which looks like a Spectrum manual. It's really nice. Nice colours as well. Got a ship whizzing around. It feels like a Spectrum manual. And inside, it looks like a Spectrum manual, and it's pretty concise. So, um, let's plug this beauty in and find out what she can do. <laughs> yeah. But first, allow me to give a short backstory for those unaware. The Spectrum Next is really a work of love, born from a discussion between Enrique Olivias and Victor Trucco, childhood friends who grew up in Brazil on clones of the Spectrum, the TK-90X. Even with clones, love for this technology was strong. 
And by 2016, in partnership with Fabio Bellavenuto, Victor had created TB Blue, a replacement board for the ZX Spectrum, adding SD card support and VGA output. This became a success in Brazil, paving the way for the obvious step to take it back home to the United Kingdom. For Victor, the obvious person to help with this was his childhood friend Enrique, who by now was running the BAFTA-winning games company Bossa Studios. The original chat was simply around the replacement board, but this quickly led to talks about creating an entirely new machine, assisted by none other than the original Spectrum designer, Rick Dickinson. Rick almost immediately agreed to the proposal and came up with several concepts based around the various original Spectrum releases. Discussion, of course, ensued, and the idea based around arguably the best specy, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum 128 Plus, prevailed. On hearing this exciting news, various community members, including Sam Dyer of Bitmap Books and Chris Hill of Games You Loved, rallied around to ensure the machine would make it to the Kickstarter phase. I was so excited, I even made a video on it back in May 2016. Yeah, let's skip over that one. So, what's next? Well, it's the Spectrum next. Yeah, clearly I still hadn't grasped the concept of audio clipping back then. By the 23rd of April 2017, the project was live, and would quickly become one of the most successful retro projects ever to hit the crowdfunding platform. I managed to get in just in time with an early bird model for the bargain price of £165 and £10 shipping, bringing it to exactly the same cost as the original 48K ZX Spectrum on first release. By the 4th of December 2017, the bare bones boards were ready and on their way out to backers who wanted to get tinkering straight away. But for the case and final hardware, the project was clearly a larger and more unwieldy beast than first imagined. Helped along by many people, including of course Jim Bagley, who programmed many excellent titles back in the day, updates would come with a reassuring frequency, and as they say, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing properly. And so, almost three years from the Kickstarter launch, this machine would finally work its way to me, landing in my hands on the 13th of February 2020. So let's take a closer look at this labour of love and see whether it was really worth the three year wait. This is one beautifully designed computer, but then I would expect no less from the incredible Rick Dickinson, responsible for some of the most iconic machines of the 80s. But yet the project is tinged with sorrow, given that Rick himself never got to see the final machine, passing away on April the 24th, 2018. But there's joy that we get to experience one of his majestic creations one final time. The next very much borrows from the 1984 Plus and 1985 Sinclair 128K model. Its width and length are very similar to the original machine, yet depth now gives way to the slenderness of the original Spectrum. Angles give way to flowing curves again, merging features of the original model and that of the Plus designs. What we end up with is a divine looking machine which grabs your eye as much as any of the previous designs did. If we go back to the packaging, we can see that it also borrows from the 1985 model. We have an angled yet partial view of a machine cutting through a coloured background, with the Sinclair logo at the bottom and recognisable Sinclair font at the top, although the new having a slightly more squished effect with wider kerning. It just works and really conveys what this project was all about. The experience. The experience of opening a treasured box of real hardware with almost endless possibilities. Going back to the manual, we can see a harking back to the original Spectrum 48K manual with this futuristic sci-fi design which just fires your imagination, sparking up wondrous worlds, all of which could be recreated in your new boxed collection of circuitry and silicon. 
Although I love to be dawdling Kindersley manuals of the Plus machines with their full colour photos and pages of basic experimentation, the covers were bland in comparison, and this machine just feels like it has plucked all the best parts of the previous Spectrums into a final package. It already feels like a true successor, and that's before even getting hands on with it. At this point, I don't even feel like I have the words to express the visual and tactile emotions the keyboard provides. Again, modelled on the Plus, it brings all that made it special and makes it into a joyful experience without deviating too far from the source material. We've got all the relevant shortcut commands on the keys, which any Spectrum owner will tell you are pretty essential. But in operation, we've got a much more forgiving depth a kinder amount of travel than the unique keyboard that Sinclair built. You can touch type here with fluidity, that just wasn't really possible on the original machines. And the clickiness is, well, it's spot on. If we examine the sides, we begin to get a feel for what the next is really about. Those embedded colour bands are such a distinct yet familiar feature, and I know it took the team several attempts before perfecting the colours. The front reveals two joystick ports thanks to the stretch goals and the campaign smashing through its quarter million pound target to reach £723,390. The left has a couple of buttons which we'll discuss later, an SD slot and a reset switch in exactly the same place you'll find on the 80s models. The rear exposes a PS2 port, VGA connector, audio out and microphone in sockets, an HDMI plug, a 9 volt DC in, and an expansion slot behind the plastic. Accelerated models also get treated to a mini HDMI out and micro USB ports courtesy of the Raspberry Pi Zero, but this model can also be expanded which again we'll get to. Ok, well I guess it's time to plug it in and see what she can do. I'll be running the HDMI through my capture card and then back to this LCD TV to begin with. We've got a rather nice branded SD card already in the slot, it's all about nice touches with this, so let's see what's on it. Oh by the way, just like previous Spectrum models, there's no power switch. I have no issues with this, where I come from we rip plugs out of sockets to power things off. Or we used to in the 80s anyway. Now initially I couldn't get any image from the HDMI port whatsoever. In the end I tried a VGA cable and then noticed you could press D on boot to switch to the digital out. I'm not sure why it doesn't default to that, maybe I just pressed the VGA key accidentally on boot. I should have read the manual to begin with in any case. Anyway, I switched it back to HDMI so I could grab some clear footage of what's going on. We can play with some CRTs later. Whee! So after choosing the output mode, in this case 576i at 50Hz through HDMI, this is what greets us. Welcome to Next ZX OS presented in a more than familiar manner. In fact, it's running in the same 256 by 192 resolution as the original machines. What follows is several pages of text informing us of how to use the next operating system, what type of files we can load, how to start tape files, how to access things like the multi-face. But rather than reading through all this, how about we actually delve into it? You can disable this message by pressing D on the final screen. The next has a file called autoexec.bas that is essentially the same as the .autoexec.bat, and so to disable this intro it simply renames the file autoexec.bas to autoexec-welcome.bas. You can create your own autoexec.bas and put whatever commands you want in there later. We're then greeted with a screen which will both look and sound more than familiar to users of 128k Spectrum models. The up and down arrows will select a menu item whilst the left and right will switch between clock speeds of 3.5MHz, 7MHz and a whopping 14MHz. But before we get caught up in all of this, we should update to the latest distribution of Next ZX OS, so let's do that. 
Pull the SD card firmly out of the Next, place it in your computer, navigate to specnext.com, click on the latest distro, click the download link, save that file somewhere, then unzip it to the root directory of your Next SD card, being sure to select yes to all when it comes to overwriting. Excellent, that's that done, but whilst we're here, let's install CPM on the card as well. CPM, the most popular Z80 based operating system of the 80s, is built into the Next's menu, allowing you to run all kinds of programs from that era, but for licensing reasons its core cannot be shipped with the system. So head to this address, download the zip file, extract it to nextzxos slash CPM on the SD card, and Bob is your blooming uncle. Right, put the SD card back in the Next, plug it back in and you should get this message. Hold down U and the Next will update to the latest distribution. When it's done, hold down the reset button for more than a second and it will cold boot back to where we were before, but with a nice shiny new core, which now has an even more whopping 28 megahertz mode and a different menu setup. This is essentially the homepage for Next ZX OS, written by Gary Lancaster. It's a descendant of the first real Spectrum operating system, Plus 3 DOS, which appeared on the final Spectrum Plus 3 models. Before that, tapes were king, discs were unlikely, and BASIC was really the only way to get about. Just like DOS, Next ZX OS has a command line interface, which is really just a cleaner version of the BASIC interface. It uses commands, directories, and drive letters you might be familiar with. For example, from here you can list the contents of the SD card, change to a different directory in it, and execute files. I mean, you could do a whole lot more, such as deleting files, renaming them, even mounting virtual disks and partitions, in addition to the standard C drive and M drive, the M being the RAM disk you'd find on the Plus 3 model. The manual contains all this information under Chapter 20, which becomes increasingly handy as you go on. Ok, let's do a quick reset and try Next Basic. Now here we have a much more powerful version of Sinclair Basic really, designed entirely around the Next. We've got powerful new commands such as Spectrum, which can, well it can do a lot really, including switching modes, changing the colour scheme, and even controlling the screensaver, which out of the box looks like this. We can even use sprites really easily too, there's even a sprite editor. There's a few demo programs in the demos directory to help you get to grips with this crazy new world. But this is really where the strength of the manual lies. There's chapters and chapters dedicated to BASIC in here. Its author, Phoebus Dokos, has done a really stellar job in that regard. And remember, anything you do here you can save into autoexec.bass, into the SD card's next ZX OS directory, and it will execute on boot. Ok, this time instead of resetting we can also press the edit button, this will bring up numerous options, including the ability to change the amount of columns on screen and even automatically renumber your basic code. Exit will do for now. Calculator gives us the usual calculator interface from previous Sinclair machines. More takes us to another menu, from which we can load a tape, a ROM cart, enter good old 48k basic, go back or even load up CPM. Since we installed the files earlier, if we enter CPM now we will get, well, CPM. If we do a directory listing, what we're seeing here is a virtual disk held in a file in the next ZXOS slash CPM folder. Of course we could set up further virtual drives on the SD card, but there's a lot more you can do here other than that. If CPM is your thing, you'll, you'll know what to do. Ok, so the menu item that most people will use straight from the box is back at the start, the browser. This is an inbuilt navigator for the SD card and whatever additional drives you set up and allows you to manage or execute any of the supported file types, which for anyone who can't remember are these. The highlighted bar will change colour accordingly for files you can open and those you cannot, because there's lots of files here, some system files and some files to look at on PC. The standard distribution comes with quite a bit to keep you busy, from classic demos stored in .tap format, 
to modern Next demos stored in the .nex format. To several games from both the classic 48k and 128k eras and a selection of next releases in both demo and full release format. My favourites are the frantic shoot 'em up action of Warhawk by Rusty Pixels and the more fundamental Night Knight, ported by David Sapier. I could just while away the evening playing this, but we have a lot to get through. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. I don't want this video to be an hour long seminar, but nor do I want it to be a simple review, so I'm going to cover what I consider to be the essential information about the next, the things I really wanted to know, and then afterwards find out what questions you wanted answering. First, let's deal with connections. Now, I've had this hooked up to your standard HDMI, but you can also use VGA or, if you have an appropriate cable, RGB, which will enable you to use SCART connections, for example. Also, note there's a slight issue with some televisions providing power down the HDMI lines of a system memory even when the power supply is disconnected. If this happens to you, then hard resets can only be achieved by holding down the reset button, or if that fails by taking the HDMI cord and power cord out to cold boot. My office is currently looking like the rubbish dump from The Labyrinth, but I still managed to fish out this rather nice IBM LCD VGA monitor, which gives a pretty sharp image. I thought about using a CRT, but this LCD pairs well and it's easier for you to see on camera. The Next also has its own stereo audio output separate from the standard ear slash mix sockets, so I've plugged some speakers into that and we're ready to go. Now, whenever you switch to a different output, you'll get this test card calibration screen. On HDMI, I could pick between 480p 60Hz and 576i 50Hz modes, but with VGA output, the selection is more extensive. Some of these modes my monitor wasn't happy with, even though the picture was clearly displaying, but as long as you can see the checkered border and there's no flicker, you're good to go. I would recommend 50Hz wherever possible given that's what almost all software on the Spectrum was coded to run at, and so should give you the least issues, although it's not like the olden days, so the next mostly deals with timings correctly regardless, so I plumped for one which required the least amount of position adjustment. And of course, the nice thing about this monitor is it gives you the correct aspect ratio. If you're using a widescreen, do the honourable thing and set the aspect ratio to 4x3. Now, this is arguably the best way to hook up the next. Another issue with HDMI is due to the way it outputs, visuals will mostly but won't always be displayed correctly, particularly more modern or demo scene programs. You can see the issues in games like Old Tower, and it's the same with anything else that uses timing trickery. With VGA, screen timing is intact, but with HDMI it gets scrambled to buggery, playing havoc with some of the graphical finessing. Ok, let's invite some more members to this party. Thanks to devices like the ZX VGA Joy, we can hook up older spectrums to VGA as well, so I've done that, giving us a system for comparison purposes. And look, just like the 128, the new one also has pop-out feet, although they're nowhere near as tall as on the 128. Now personally, I'm keen to try some of my old tape games on this thing, so let's do that first. For that, you're likely to need one of these cables. You see, rather than separate mono jacks, the Next has a single 3.5mm stereo jack to handle both the mic and ear signals. If you split that jack into two mono connections, then you can connect up a tape player as normal, but you need to be careful that your tape player doesn't output a stereo signal. If it does, then you'll need to convert that to mono and connect it up to the appropriate jack. 
Once all that's plugged in, well the easiest route is to use the tape loader option from the main menu. Once you select that, the screen will start to flash and you can press play on your tape. If the volume is set too low or too high on the tape player, then the next might have some issues picking up the signal, so you might need to adjust that. But all being well, the cassette will start to load. If you have further loading problems, then it may be because your game requires 48k mode, in which case, select the 48k basic option, press J followed by two quotation marks, enter and you can play the tape. If you're still having issues, well there's some more things we can try in a bit, but remember these cassettes are old. This copy of Batman had some spurious sound corruption halfway through for example, and so wouldn't load. I had to source another copy. So finally, here we are with Batman the Movie running beautifully. This is the 128K version as you can tell by the A1 music. If I load the same on the plus 128 then, well it's identical. Timings, colours, even the response time is the same. The size difference in the border is simply due to the way the ZX VGA Joy outputs. But thanks to the Next having an FPGA hardware implementation rather than an emulator, lag is non-existent, and it's barely even perceivable even through HDMI. So what about joysticks? Well, with the Spectrum you have two varieties. The Kempston interface was an expansion pack which allowed you to use any joysticks or gamepads which complied with the Atari joystick port standard. However, Sinclair also had their own interface which, although using the same connectors, had differently wired pins and actually mapped to numeric key presses. This allowed you to use a joystick in games without joystick support, but also caused confusion. Thankfully, the Next allows you to use either of these standards straight out of the box. The left 9-pin connector is currently set up as a Kempston port, whilst the right is set up for a Sinclair port. So an ancient joystick like my preference, the Konix Speed King, will work just fine, as will all of these. It doesn't mean, however, that you can use Sinclair or SJS joysticks in the other port, but then why would you want to? It just makes your Atari standard controller appear to the Spectrum as a Sinclair controller. There's even new joysticks and pads specifically made for the Next, like this ProPad, which can make use of the Next's ability to detect three distinct fire buttons rather than the singular of old. Any new hardware that I mention like this will be linked in the video description by the way. A lot of joysticks had this double cord arrangement, so you can use them either as Kempston compatible or as Sinclair compatible. Other than that, you could just use a Master System pad or even grab an 8-bit dough pad with wireless connector and that should work fine. Just don't try and plug things in and out when the Spectrum is on, otherwise all sorts of weird things can happen. Remember, this is really a fragile little Spectrum at heart. Okay, back to loading. So if you don't fancy loading from cassette, you can use one of these Arduino loaders. Either of these choices will get around the issue of custom loaders. You see, some games, such as Joe Blade 2, use a loading method that isn't compatible with most image formats. Of course, with cassette, that's not an issue. The Arduino can use TZX files, which really capture the audio of a game loading and so are compatible. The Next itself, however, can't convert TZX files because they require some external processing to turn the file into a stream that the Next can read. But if you have an accelerated Next or you install a Raspberry Pi Zero, you can get around this issue. We'll get to that later. But clearly, loading games from the SD card is the easiest option. I downloaded a new bundle of Next titles from Software Amusements on itch.io. Simply dump them in the games folder and you can load them up in the browser. My favourite here is Montana Mike, mainly because I loved the Indiana Jones games on the original Specky. But of course, you can also copy classic titles, which have been saved to a .tap, Z80 or DSK image, to name a few. My Next had some issues loading the odd tap file, such as Trapdoor, but that could very well be just a dodgy image. If you have problems with an image, try a Z80 or SNA file, as they are actual snapshots of a loaded game in memory. 
I tried a snapshot of Trapdoor and it worked just fine. You can even get troublesome titles like Joe Blade 2 to work using this method, bypassing the quirky loading. If you're feeling adventurous, you can make your own images or alternatively source from excellent resource sites like World of Spectrum. Simply download, plonk them on the SD card, being sure to unzip files where necessary, put the SD card back in the Spectrum and then browse your chosen images. So here I've got an image of OutRun. It's easy enough to navigate to it and press return, but to ensure it loads properly I need to tell the next what mode to configure itself for. So we have 128k mode for 128k software, user 0 mode which gives you 128k of RAM but disables plus 3 basic, 48k mode for your bog standard spectrum, pentagon timings for providing timings appropriate for a Russian clone, and your standard next plus 3 mode. So whenever you load a tape or disk image, unless it's specific to the next, you'll be asked what mode to load it in. User 0 usually has the broadest compatibility if you're unsure. There's also a load of additional loading options. You can choose whether to pause after loading, providing a soul warming tape loading simulation, so you can sit for 5 minutes and just imagine the world which awaits. Although for purists, I've noticed this doesn't seem to accurately simulate the actual tape loading in all instances. For example, on Batman, the borders should alternate between black and red here, but the simulation shows them as multicolor. Ah, you know, it, it's close enough. You can also change a crap load of advanced options, and of course, change the running speed. Loading using Pi Audio is for owners of an accelerated Next looking to load those pesky TZX files. These options are designed to limit conflicts between old software and the next environment and ensure that the system can load, well, everything really. Outrun might be tedious and a bit hard to control normally, but in 7 MHz mode it actually feels like Outrun. This is how the game was intended to be played. It's just unfortunate Ocean couldn't optimise it enough at the time. Obvious games to try here are Chase HQ, which works beautifully and even more smoothly in 7 MHz mode, although it does screw up the sound effects a bit. <laughs> Depending on what games you try, speeding the system up might help or hinder your experience. Trans Am, frankly, is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Stunt Car Racer is incredible. It's programmed so well that even when switched to 28 megahertz, it plays exactly as it should, just silky smooth. It really is a treat playing it like this. Hard driving is also improved, although as unplayable as ever. Driller is more playable at 7 MHz, but if you go any higher then the aiming cursor becomes so fast it's unusable, which is a shame as movement is silky smooth Jesus at 28 Christ. MHz. Ah, I can't place this. Interestingly, Darkseid, although running on the same engine, doesn't have the same cursor issues. We can go all the way up to 28 megahertz, and the cursor is just as controllable as it was at 3.5. So this is all good, it's, it's excellent in fact. But wait, you might say, how does the next manage multi-load images? Well, let's go back to Outrun. Now when we get to a checkpoint, the game would normally request you to start the tape and load the next stage, but with the next, it's utterly seamless. It automatically handles it and we're instantly in the subsequent level. There's some other trickery you can do here if you want ultimate cassette control, but we'll get to that in a bit. So armed with this knowledge, you should really be able to load whatever you need until your heart's content. But if you happen to find a game, or more likely a piece of hardware, that won't play ball in any of these modes, which seems to be very little, then the machine has a neat trick. Well, a collection of tricks that can help you. See, whenever you cold boot the next, you have the option to press space. This will then throw you into what the team call its personalities. From here, you can choose to load directly into a 48k spectrum mode, 128k, plus 2, plus 3, a Russian clone, even ZX80 or 81 emulation. 
There's also various looking glass ROMs, which are just like your usual ROM, but allow you to type commands into 48k BASIC rather than using the tokenized key commands originally designed to save memory space. Handy for when you've forgotten the placement of go to or border or any other command, which usually requires a combination of key presses to display. Once you're in these personalities, the next will function just like the original machine, and when you reset, it will remain the default selection. However, you can always press space to bring up the personality screen again and change your selection. If you press E on any of these, you can actually configure the machine before you boot it, allowing you to choose joystick types, whether a Kovox is installed, a multi-face, you name it, it's here. It also means that, thankfully, next features like the joystick ports still work, and whatever else you configure here, but almost all of the usual next functionality is now gone. So these modes are useful for running old hardware which might not run in next mode, as well as problematic software, but you won't get access to SD loading without, you know, a separate div MMC interface, or an appropriate ROM for the multiface, or incredibly useful features such as this NMI button on the side. In next mode, press that and you get this handy little menu. This is emulator-like functionality within an FPGA environment. It's amazingly well implemented. We've got all sorts of options here. You can save a snapshot of a system's memory, allowing you to effectively save a game wherever you are. Classic modes will save as a .SNA format, whilst the next snapshots save as .SNX, as you might imagine they're not cross-compatible. You can poke a game by loading a .poc file. I've put a link in the description with a massive collection of these, allowing you to cheat your way through even the most unfair titles. Or you can just take a screenshot if that's your thing. If you want more control of multi-loaders, or just like to feel you're using a real cassette, perhaps you want to change the sides of the tape, then the NMI menu also allows you to select a different image for input, so you can switch between sides A, B, or even different tapes until your heart is content. It even allows you to browse that image and choose a specific point to load from. Clever stuff, although the game, if programmed well, will search for a specific part of the game it needs anyway. We also get debugging tools, an on-screen key map, and settings which allows you to change the joystick input types, so you can assign different joysticks to each port, including selecting whether you're using a Mega Drive pad to take advantage of its three buttons. Turn scan lines on, change timings, the screen output frequency, change the direct memory access from Z80 to next mode, even change the keyboard type. Everything feels like it's here, it's so well done. If you want shortcuts, then pressing NMI along with different number keys will also allow you to tweak most of these options in-game without having to go through the menu. You can even double the output resolution by pressing NMI and 2, but don't do this with an old TV, it's probably not going to end well. You might notice that nearby is also a drive button. This has the main purpose of being a div MMC NMI button for use under ESX DOS, which you're unlikely to need unless you've used it before, in which case you don't need me to tell you what to do. Oh, and if you happen to brick your system, you can hold down the drive and NMI button on boot and it will automatically load the updater module from the SD card. These guys have really thought of everything. Next up, excuse the pun, ROM packs. Well, as we saw earlier, there's a handy menu selector to load them. Simply take the plastic panel off the expansion slot on the back of the next, insert a relevant interface, plug the cart in, and away you go. The next will automatically connect up the expansion port circuitry and then disconnect it again when finished. Lovely job. But remember, never plug expansion packs in when the spectrum is on, as you can damage the hardware. Even with the clever method this uses of powering off the edge connector when it's not expected to be in use. ROM packs will also work in compatible personalities, just like microdrives, if that's your thing. I don't have any microdrives to test with, but I'm assured they work beautifully. This goes for a lot of old hardware, especially in a relevant personality, as they're designed to prevent old hardware conflicting with any of the next hardware, which might be using the same resources. This is both a limitation and strength of the FPGA-style implementation. 
In fact, pretty much any hardware you had for the original Spectrum, regardless of its model, can be used with the Next one way or another. If you've got a Kovox, Spec Drum or Sound Drive, then the Next has built-in functionality for that, so you don't even need to plug it into the interface. For other peripherals, you can add the ROM onto your SD card and also acquire that functionality. The levels of flexibility here are enormous. One thing that is lacking is the 128 serial port, which could support MIDI interfaces. Now, you could grab a cheetah MIDI interface if that's your thing, but as it stands, there doesn't seem to currently be MIDI support on the Next. However, I'm sure it could be added via the Next UART at a later date if you were really keen for it. But we do have one final port I haven't mentioned. Of course, there's a PS2 keyboard and mouse port. You probably won't plug a keyboard into this because the next keyboard is really good. But a mouse you could use with some software like Nextdoor. Oh yeah, smashing out some quality chip tunes like it's 2020. Because the original Spectrum didn't have all these channels. Oh yeah. You'll need to go to demo slash mouse and run mouse.bass if you want to use a mouse and then put that in your autoexec.bass if you want to use it going forward. But once you do, it's a really fluid experience. Nextdoor is a digital audio workstation designed specifically for the Next. I've got a physical copy on SD card, which I ordered from Japan. You can just pop this in your Next and it will load up. Now, this beautiful program supports all three of the Next's AY sound chips, giving a total of nine channels of audio to create your latest or old musical masterpiece. Now that is nice. This is all spiffing, but how about we go back to basics, real basics? Well, for this, I thought I'd go back to my 128 Dawling Kindersley book and try a nice sunrise. Yeah, that's nice. But how about I try and program something that's consistent without any random numbers that can be compared with the original 128. I'm going to type it out in 48k on the next using the looking glass ROM just to make things easier, then save it to tape. Load it up on the standard spectrum and compare the results. Voila! Isn't it a thing of beauty? Pyramids. Interestingly, the Next completed the program noticeably faster than the 128. Whether that's an artifact of the Looking Glass ROM or the Next just runs slightly faster, I can't tell you without further investigation. Maybe something we can come back to. So, I've got the standard version of the Next. However, it's more than possible to upgrade it to the accelerated version with just a few additions. So, let's get the hood off and get to work. Now, before we take this apart, I just want to thank today's sponsor, Audible, for making this video possible. Now, Audible isn't just something I'm promoting for the sake of it, I've used it for ages. I listen to it when I'm at home through Alexa, I listen to it when I'm in the office. It just helps me work and do things because I've got something to listen to and enjoy. I've been wanting to get through Sherlock Holmes for ages, ever since my dad spoke about it when I was little. But it's only through Audible that I've managed to do it. Last year I hammered through the definitive Sherlock Holmes collection by Stephen Fry and it was amazing. We're talking 70 odd hours of audiobook and it only counted as one audiobook credit. And you can too with a 30 day free trial giving you one audiobook and two Audible originals. Just visit audible.com slash nostalgia nerd or text nostalgia nerd to 500 500. That's audible.com slash nostalgia nerd or text nostalgia nerd to 500 500 and get started today. Right, let's go back to the next and see what's inside. It's clear the next is designed to make this easy. There's just a few screws on the bottom, a few screws on the board, then you can just pull out these keyboard connectors to free the board. These are the same connectors you'd find in a standard spectrum, so you can just put this in a spectrum case if you desire. 
Whilst we're here, let's brush over the specs. So the main processor here is an enhanced Z80 clocked at 3.5 MHz, but with those turbo modes. It's recreated in a field programmable gate array, or FPGA. This means that the original hardware is actually recreated using programmable logic blocks. And so although it's not the actual original hardware, it's the next <laughs> best thing, and certainly better than emulation. Because of this, enhancements are built into the FPGA. We've got a 512 color palette with 256 on screen, hardware scrolling, sprites, three AY sound chips with digital audio, and currently one megabyte of RAM, which is housed here. My first upgrade is going to be to double the RAM, which is about as straightforward as it comes. I've got two 512 kilobyte memory chips here, which I've also linked below. All I need to do is align the notch in the bottom corner to the cutout corner of the chip holder and press it in firmly. You'll notice there's a gap to the side of the chip, that's fine, ignore it. Next is the Wi-Fi module. This is an ESP8266 ESP-01, and it fits exactly into this socket here. Again, incredibly easy. Now I could also install the real-time clock and onboard speaker, but I'm saving that for another video on my extra channel. Today is just getting the essential upgrades in. Now if you've got a Raspberry Pi Zero, you can install the accelerator board. I've got a Pi Zero W which works absolutely fine. You'll need to solder a female header onto the Pi to connect it to the next male connector. I thought I'd save myself time and use a solderless hammer kit. With these, you simply tap the header into the board and it forms a mechanical joint. But for the love of God, don't do what I did and install the header like this. The next actually needs it to be put on the back of the board. This meant some serious faffing before I was able to reinstall it correctly. Also, because of this, I really wouldn't recommend using a hammer kit as you'll need to put the board components side down to install and you'll risk damaging components on the board. Make sure the connector is flush with the board, and then we need to put the zero image on the SD card. So go back to the distro page at specnext.com, navigate to the bottom, click on the next Pi distribution download link, save the file, then extract the contents of the archive, then extract the contents of the subsequent archive, and you'll have this. Now you'll need an imaging program such as Bellina Etcher, which you can get from here. Download that, run the file, and you'll have this screen. Now you can select the next Pi image, which in this case is called NextPi 2019-0929.img. Then select the SD card and you can write the image to the microSD. Pop that in the zero, push the zero in the next connector, and boom, job done. You now have a NextPi installation by D. Rimron Suter that handles SID files, TZX files, and even Xbox controller support. Now we can reassemble. I'll be sure to remove this bit of plastic first though. Now the board should slip back in and once sealed up our exposed zero connectors should be visible on the back. Lovely job. Let's plug this Bessie back in. Now on boot you'll see our increased memory available on the bottom of the menu. Nice. Okay let's see if we can load some TZX files now. Well, would you look at that? The next is now making use of the Pi Zero to unpack and stream the TZX audio, meaning we get a completely authentic loading experience. None of that simulated nonsense. Even the Pac-Man loading game works fine. Now, the accelerator's original job was also to, well, accelerate. But due to the Kickstarter campaign doing so well, an expanded FPGA was utilised, allowing for faster modes built in. Therefore, it's not as necessary now, but further uses are planned for it. I had a brief chat to Enrique, who's a lovely guy. In fact, the entire Next community seems to be really nice. And he mentioned a goal of having advanced maths capabilities, such as 3D processing. Can you imagine an OpenGL engine available for the Z80? That would be amazing. Okay, how about we get this thing online? 
To do this, navigate to demo slash ESP and select Wi-Fi.bas, then type run, press 1 to set your SSID and once you've put your name and password in, you should be connected. Now this opens a whole world of possibilities, but let's just try Nextel. Head to demo slash nxtel, open nxtel.nex and we get this magnificence. If you don't get this, then try the alternative version in the nxtel2 directory. Now what can we do here? Well, we can get access to various Nextel servers, which I believe are currently run by members of the glorious Spectrum Next community. <laughs> it's presented in teletext format, and you can find anything here from Bitboozle to the news. I would dedicate an entire video to this alone, but already this video has run on for long enough. So how about we answer a few of your questions and then wrap this video up, finally. So earlier in the week I asked you what questions you wanted to know about the Spectrum next, so let's go through a few of them. How does it compare to the Sam Coupe and which major publishing houses are going to be supporting it? Now many would consider the Sam Coupe the true successor to the Spectrum. Manufactured in 1989 by Miles Gordon Technology and designed to have true compatibility with the Spectrum. It featured a Z80B CPU clocked at 6 MHz. It also had 256 kilobytes of RAM as standard, but really it lacks behind the next in every category. Regarding software houses, yes, Thalamus have included some games on the next distribution and are planning new versions of their games. How good is the manual? Excellent. How stable is it? Very stable, I didn't have... Uh, there was a couple of glitches, but you know, hardly any, I've been using it all week. Why does adding a Z or an X onto anything make it automatically cooler? I guess because they're the least used letters, so the less we see them, the cooler they appear. It's like anything in life. How many of the classic Spectrum games from back in the day will be getting a glow up for the next? I put this question to Enrique and he said yes, two versions of Lords of Midnight are included with the next and there are people working on a new version of Attic Attack. Lemmings has a demo version, Rex will get a reboot and Nodes of Yasod. <laughs> Does it make Jet Set Willy any bloody easier? No. No it doesn't. Does it blend? This isn't the early noughties, this isn't frog in a blender, I'm not going to stick this in a blender, that would be insane. What it feels like. It feels like your mu- How is it for a casual gamer who wants a quick injection of nostalgia? Pretty good, I mean out of the box you get quite a lot, as it stands, so yeah, go for it. Does it play Commodore 64 games? Get out! Just get out of here! Basically all I want to know is when can I buy one on Amazon? Another thought on Rike, there are no plans to take the next, we make it basically at cost, no margin. To take it to shops would make its price jump beyond the unreasonable, unless we cut costs by manufacturing in China, etc. But it's made for the community rather than profit. I can't think of anything serious because that's already been asked, so instead I'll go with this. What does its plastic case taste like? It tastes like your mother. How do you actually get one if you didn't back it? You joined the second Kickstarter, which is coming soon. What exactly is the point, I would like to know? Why would anyone want one? Well, let's delve into both of those right now. So it's that fundamental question, what's the point? Well, I mean, what's the point in life? To have fun? I've certainly had fun with this next and that's good enough for me. But if you want the wider story then I think there are several avenues. For some this could simply be a programming platform free from all the libraries, framework and constraints of modern day systems. It's like the 80s all over again where you plug in a machine and you can instantly start coding. I for one miss that, there's something about the brutal simplicity which just draws you in, and then because this isn't a complex beast you can actually gain an understanding of what you're doing. Even using a high level language like BASIC, you can see how your commands affect the system, it's an elegance we lack these days. And sure, you could just use a retro system for that, but this is a new machine with a new community, excited to see what they can produce. It's not a rehash, it's current, but it's grounded in the past. Of course, it also calls to your nostalgia bone if you have one of those. We always look back on previous decades with rose-tinted spectacles. 
Then when we get hold of the hardware again, it can sometimes be a letdown. It's clunky, the output looks crap, you can't type on it. It's not how we remember it, because we adapt our memories to meet modern day expectations. The next creates a bridge to solve that problem, and for the casual retro gamer it makes the whole experience fun again. You know, this is a machine for tinkerers, for creative types, for those who want real hardware rather than a gimmicky retro rehash, with a shiny emulator shoved inside it. But it's also for the casual gamer, because it's so easy to get to grips with. You can play with this machine, you can add ROMs, you can expand it, pick apart the code, and really gain a broader understanding for computing. There's something fundamental about being able to actually count the number of pixels on screen, about being able to watch code execute and then dive into the debugging tools. That makes it so much easier to understand than your high definition app running device of today. I think it's great and it's a machine I'm keeping in my house rather than the office, because it's just that type of computer. If you missed out on the first Kickstarter, Enrique reckons the second one will appear towards the end of March, so keep your eyes peeled and keep yourself updated on specnext.com which has regular and consistent updates, as well as links to upcoming games and all sorts else. If you can, join the ZX Spectrum Next Facebook group which I found an invaluable resource. If demand is really high, maybe, just maybe, we'll see this amazing Spectrum handheld come to fruition as well. I really hope it does, but from what I've heard, I'm not holding out hope. You know, it's unfortunate that Sir Clive Sinclair himself didn't have anything to do with these actual machines. His name may be on the case, but the actual ownership of that now lies with Sky, having been bought out by Amstrad in the mid-80s and then sold on. Thankfully, they allowed this project to use the name, thanks to a charitable donation. So, that's nice. So, thank you to Enrique, Jim Bagley, Phobus, Mike Allen, and the entire team for bringing this together. Also, thanks to the ZX Spectrum Next Facebook group community and all the people who I haven't mentioned, who helped bring this project to life and keep it going. The back of the box sums it up beautifully. Prepare to fall in love with a computer all over again. I have, and I'm sure you will too. Thanks for watching, have a great evening. Yes, okay, I deviated from Heritage and put an inline power switch in. Don't tell anyone. Also, link in the description.